Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Our guest today is Laszlo Nemes, who uh, is a philosopher and bioethicist, and he's also interested in popular philosophy. And uh, he teaches at Semmelweis University in uh, Budapest. And today he's going to talk to us about de extinction. That's welcome, everyone. Thank you very much. I this is the topic and the uh, title, and this is my plan to uh, provide you with a general introduction to this uh, relatively new topic and uh, related area, uh, which uh, recently gained a, a significant uh, uh, popularity or attention from different uh, directions, uh, from scientists and even uh, from the uh, popular media. And uh, it is a good opportunity to bring uh, different um, um, fields or disciplines uh, together, such as uh, evolutionary biology, uh, genetics, uh, ecology, and uh, what is even more important for me today, bioethics, uh, uh, environmental ethics, and philosophy of biology. So this, this is an important and interesting uh, topic. Uh, Probably you heard about uh, certain things related to the extinction or resurrection biology. There are some general introductory books uh, in the market. For example, these two ones, The Rise of the Necrofauna, another name for this uh, phenomenon and uh, field written by Brit Ray and the Regenesis. Uh, you can see that uh, George Church, the famous uh, biologist uh, uh, from the Harvard University, is one of the key figures in this field. And um, this is a very promising one, but at the same time, it raises some ethical uh, worries. And I will talk about these and the philosophical aspects of uh, the topic. Uh, for example, not last year in September, we could, uh, we could read uh, this uh, in the newspapers, the return of the mammoth George Church backed company launches with $15 million for elephant size quest, that is to resurrect the woolly mammoth uh, to prevent uh, uh, the permafrost in Siberia to get defrosted. And you can see that the Colossal is the name of this startup focused on the extinction, had raised 15 million, a relatively large amount of money for a project that involves CRISPR technology to genetically re-engineer Asian elephants to be more like mammoths. Billionaire Thomas Tull, Tull, Tull uh, was behind this enterprise with a movie producer. So this uh, gained some popularity and many people debated uh, this prospect to give uh, the woolly mammoth uh, back to, uh, to exit. Uh, going back to the history, in 1984, the prestigious journal, MIT Journal Technology Review, reported that it was a successful in, uh, effort to, uh, to resurrect uh, the woolly mammoth uh, by using the retrobeating technology technique. And um, this is, was a real success. And many people uh, then talked about this. Uh, the only problem with this report was that it was a joke, joke, nothing else. It was published in the April 1 edition, the Fool's Day edition of the journal. But at the same time, um, it uh, was a, an idea very stubborn in the minds of people for years or even for decades after the, uh, uh, the publication of this uh, hoax, right? It was a joke, nothing else. But it was seemingly the old dream of many people to see uh, the woolly mammoths or even dinosaurs living again. And um, so this is a nice idea, especially for uh, for children and uh, for scientists uh, and, uh, and virtually for everyone, including myself, uh, I have to uh, uh, admit. So there are some animals uh, close to extinction, uh, which can be relevant uh, here to uh, talk about uh, in relation to the potential resurrection of uh, certain species. Uh, at the edge of uh, extinction. Cheetah, for example, can be a star species, a very imposant, uh, great, and very uh, beautiful animal uh, close to our heart. And uh, for example, the passenger pigeon already extincted, the Pyrenean, Pyrenean uh, ibex, uh, the gastric brooding frog, and the dodo uh, can be 
uh, examples of these uh, efforts for dinosaurs and other similar animals from the past. Um, and even you can, of course, uh, think about the popular movies such as the Jurassic Park in the case of uh, dinosaurs, uh, woolly mammoth, our example, saber tooth tiger, Tasmanian, Tasmanian tigers can be other examples, or the Neanderthals even, and partly other uh, uh, type of uh, example here. And uh, we can raise the question or this possibility to create a, even radically new life forms never heard, never uh, seen uh, before. And uh, you can, of course, use your uh, fantasy to to create uh, uh, virtual species in the in the future, or even cyborgs, partly natural, partly artificial uh, life forms. As uh, these authors. Uh, write uh, in a paper, a very good uh, paper, the extinction and the extinction of species. At the moment, numerous research groups around the world are working towards the extinction of different species. Efforts are underway, for example, to engineer a passenger pigeon from the genome of the related bantail pigeon. Woolly mammoths might be cloned from the tissue preserved in the permafrost of the Siberian tundra. Alternatively, this is the solution uh, uh, offered by church, an Indian elephant genome might serve as a template to the CRISPR gene editing. Several groups are working towards cloning Tasmanian tigers. And there are some other uh, possibilities, such as uh, the back from the dead, scientists looking to clone the dodo, the very famous, uh, beautiful, big, uh, um, bird uh, killed by humans a couple of centuries ago. And these are the techniques, technologies, biological technologies, biotechnological uh, methods used uh, in uh, the extinction or the resurrection biology, the back breeding uh, using uh, traditional uh, breeding methods carefully, uh, going back to in time to create uh, similar life forms uh, uh, to the ancient uh, uh, species, the hybridization, for example, when you can find uh, uh, functional eggs or sperms, uh, um, you can use these uh, to create hybrids. And uh, further, by using further breeding techniques, uh, you can uh, create uh, um, similar uh, individuals, similar to the original ones, or the somatic cell nuclear transfer, the cross species cloning can be another possibility. In the case of woolly mammoth, for example, this is one of the uh, mostly mentioned uh, option or the gene genome editing, the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, technology, which is a new uh, uh, perspective, a new prospect uh, to, uh, to bring these uh, species back to existence. Uh, this is about uh, creating uh, genetically and phenotypically similar uh, similar individuals, but not uh, uh, historically related once to the original uh, extinct species. And there are some other um, 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 technological tools used here. For example, the artificial bomb, that is the ictogenesis technology, can be used or should be used uh, to make these uh, biotechnological uh, methods uh, successful in the near future. And there is another example, Celia, the Pyrenean Ibex, the latest one, the last uh, individual in this uh, uh, species died in 2000 and was cloned in 2009. The sad uh, fact is that uh, she died again after seven minutes. So it was not really successful, but technically uh, we can say that this was a successful uh, uh, attempt to uh, to use the techniques, the cloning techniques uh, in this case. What about, uh, uh, this will be my question, uh, can we uh, use the word uh, resurrection, death, and uh, even uh, life in uh, relation to uh, biological species? And how can we approach uh, the general ethics of uh, uh, resurrection in the case of human person? Now, this will be my starting point to talk about human persons. In this case, 
our case, uh, is quite clear that we are living organisms and we can die and we can imagine that we can be even resurrected uh, under certain conditions. First question, ethical question, do we have a duty to save the life of a person, person in need, in danger, uh, after an accident, for example, or a heart attack? I think that we uh, will agree that we have a strong duty to save this uh, Save the life of this person. You can recall the example of uh, the thought experiment uh, of the shadow pond used by Peter Singer, for example. In that case, it was quite clear that uh, that um, um, ordinary person has a strong duty to save the life of the child in the pond. There are, of course, some exceptions. So, for example, when she doesn't want it, uh, that is, to refuse the treatment in the case of a clinical ethics. So, non voluntary euthanasia can be another example uh, for this exception because, in this case, it is uh, uh, impossible to figure out the real wish of the, of the patient uh, to, to leave or, uh, or die. But there can be another consideration based on justice in the case of uh, triage, again, in clinical practice, when it is not uh, uh, an absolute duty to save the life of one uh, particular uh, person. The other question, the next one, do we have a duty to bring a person back to life from clinical death? I think that the answer should be uh, similar. That is, uh, prima facie, we have a strong duty to, uh, to bring uh, this person back uh, uh, from the clinical death to life uh, with, with similar exceptions, of course. And the main question, do we have a duty to resurrect the dead person? It sounds bizarre, of course, but at least as a thought experiment, we can raise this as a serious ethical, uh, ethical question and an ethical dilemma. Do we have a duty to resurrect the dead person? Which kind of persons and, uh, and why? What could be the underlying reason to do this? For example, in the form of the genome, for example, only the genome. Can we resurrect the dead person uh, genome in the form of, uh, of cloning. In this case, we cannot uh, uh, talk about the resurrection of uh, the person as such, that is the personal identity, the personal characteristics, but only the genome, that is to create a similar uh, biological individual, genetically similar, or the, uh, 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 the same uh, uh, individual. Um, as the original uh, person, or the body, for example, the body itself. And what is even more demanding, to resurrect the mind and the self or the personality, or the body and the mind uh, alone, like, uh, um, alike, like in the, in the uh, for example, in the uh, case of uh, cryonics, for example, the defrost, the frozen uh, person, the body and the mind to lead normal, relatively or hopefully normal life again. So we can, uh, uh, pondering about this possibility, would they have a duty to this, uh, uh, to, to resurrect this, uh, this already dead person? I think that it depends on, depends on, for example, the age, uh, about the nature of the uh, death, for example, it was a, was a, a timely, uh, so-called timely or untimely death, or for example, what about our responsibility, for example, when we unintentionally caused the death of this person, uh, for example, in a, in a car accident or, or just uh, killing or causing the death in other way of this person. In this case, we are responsibly for uh, her death. And so we are responsible to restore the original state, that is to resurrect the dead person, then if we can. But it is a rather questionable possibility, of course. And uh, some related uh, ethical questions. Do we have a duty to live at all? Do we have a duty to reproduce? Do we have a duty to nurture the embryo? Uh, or the fetus, um, somewhat uh, related to questions. And a historical example again, um, from the Bible, a well-known story, Jesus resurrects uh, Lazarus, who uh, was uh, 
uh, actually dead, but could be resurrected by this mysterious power of uh, Jesus Christ as a uh, as a person in the whole fullest sense. Jesus once, this is the story uh, from John 11. Jesus once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a kid with a stone uh, laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord said, Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad other for he has been there four days, four days after uh, his death. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said, uh, he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out, the dead man came out, his hands and feet rubbed with uh, strips of linen and the clothes around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. So I promise that I uh, uh, stopped uh, this line of uh, uh, religious uh, uh, thinking, but I think that this can be uh, troubling for us when we think about this uh, miraculous power and related the ethical uh, duties or obligations to help uh, uh, already dead persons. Uh, in this case, I think that it was, it, uh, we can say that it was an untimely death. What about individual animals, not human beings, human persons? For example, in the case of companion animals, this is a real possibility in the case of, uh, say, dogs or cats. Uh, for example, there is, is even a, a great uh, market uh, for this, and the business, uh, Barbara Streisand, uh, uh, for example, announced that uh, she's, uh, she cloned her dog called Samantha, not once, but even twice. I continue uh, this citation. The cloning of humans is illegal. The cloning of farm animals has been banned by the EU parliament. The cloning of pets, however, is a gray area. Um, and there is this Korean company called Soom Biotech charges $100,000 for a cloned pup. So even though this is a very expensive uh, uh, method and uh, still uh, has a large uh, uh, market and the need uh, for this kind of uh, uh, biotechnological uh, help to, to resurrect individual or seemingly individual uh, ducks by using uh, uh, cloning, cloning technology. So biotech clones ducks on a near industrial case the company was set up by Huang Wu Suk, you can remember, a former leader in the field of stem cell research, an infamous one who fell from grace in 2005. And after it emerged, he fabricated a series of experiments. So he was uh, uh, so, um, ex, um, um, told uh, for certain scientific misconduct, but no, he is one of the leading figures of this uh, pet cloning business. So again, this is not about the particular uh, individual dog, but a very similar um, individual, genetically the same one uh, used by this uh, uh, ethically questionable cloning technology. And this will be our question, the main one, can we talk about the death of a species at all? Can a species die? This will be the first question. Can a species live at all? And can a species so uh, get uh, resurrected? What is a species? The first question. Uh, seems to be rather banal question, but we know quite well that it was not that. Species problem played a central role in the development of uh, the field called uh, the philosophy of biology from the 1960s, 1970s. And uh, Michael T. Gisselin and David L. Hall uh, uh, was the, were the main uh, figures in uh, this story who uh, tried to redefine uh, or recategorize 
the biological species in a radical way. We can see this as in this uh, in the title of this uh, uh, famous and uh, classic uh, article from 1974, written by Michael uh, Giselin, radical solution to species problem. What was the radicality of this uh, solution that is uh, tried to uh, to fix certain practical problems, anomalies in taxonomy and evolutionary biology by offering a metaphysical solution to this question? And uh, the point was that it based, was it based on the Aristotelian uh, system of uh, categories. And in the past, traditionally, species were regarded as natural kinds, uh, uh, class terms uh, defined by essentialistic uh, criteria. And these uh, uh, essence uh, were regarded as eternal was regarded as eternal essential similarities uh, uh, define the membership of uh, uh, of for the for the given species uh, for the members individual members and at the same time the alternative this radical solution uh, offered uh, uh, a metaphysical solution that is uh, uh, we try to uh, recategorize the species, species uh, as individuals. This was a, uh, the, the key word uh, for this solution, and species as historical entities. So uh, the integrity of the species were uh, maintained or were defined in a, a space and time by uh, referring to. Uh, the categorical status as an individual. The species were uh, regarded as individuals, right? So this is the point. Uh, what will happen with the uh, practical efforts to resurrect certain species when we take this uh, approach in philosophy of biology uh, seriously? This is my question. Ceasing to exist is one possibility, death or extinction, three different words for, for uh, somewhat similar uh, phenomena. Um, one uh, difficulty is that uh, in the case of uh, species, we refer to individuals, individual specimens, the last ones uh, in the case of uh, Celia, we could see this. Uh, this was a goat with, uh, with a particular name, Celia, with a particular life history, and we could regret uh, her death. But at the same time, uh, we uh, simultaneously talked about uh, uh, the fate of the species as such. Well, this is the double nature, uh, as I call uh, it in the presentation. So how does an organism die? This is going to be another related question. So we can know a lot about, uh, but it's, there are still very uh, controversial points about uh, uh, the exact, uh, the proper definition of death in the case of human organisms and in the case of other organisms and even non-organismic uh, uh, functional uh, uh, entities. How does a human organism die? Uh, it's very close to us. And in bioethics, there are many, still many debates about uh, that. But at the same time, there is a, a relatively large consensus about uh, the acceptable uh, approach to this uh, in, the, in the form of uh, the whole brain death, which is uh, widely accepted as the best one to define the end of the life of uh, uh, the human organism. Can a species die? This will be the main question. Or can a species live at all, get resurrected? Important questions. When we see the uh, analogy between uh, the species as an individual, a biological individual, uh, as somewhat similar to the individual organism. So this will be a question, how, how this uh, analogy uh, stands. Are species individuals? Are species organisms? Or what about the relationship between extinction and death? In ordinary language and in the mass media, we often find this formulation 
about the death of uh, death of a species. We could see some examples in the beginning of my presentation. But is it a literal um, analogy, or is it just a poetic uh, metaphor to talk about the end of the existence of a particular species? Next um, point will be about the death of the human organism. Uh, a citation from Stephen Lorry's uh, good uh, uh, summary of the topic from the Nature Neuroscience 205, the concept of death at present, the most accepted definition of human death is the permanent cessation of the critical functions of the organism as a whole. The organism as a whole is an old concept in theoretical biology that refers to its unity and functional integrity, not to the simple sum of its parts and encompasses the concept of an organism's critical system. Critical functions are those without which the organism as a whole cannot function, control of respiration and circulation, neuron doctrine, and homeostatic regulation and consciousness. That is defined by the irreversible loss of all these functions. So in the case of uh, the death of an organism, the human one, for example, we refer to, uh, to these uh, a uh, very special uh, functioning of the whole system. So what about uh, other kinds of uh, organisms or individuals? Um, so what is life? It is a, um, um, an old question and still an open one. Are viruses living beings or, 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 or not? Uh, there are still different uh, opinions about this question, and uh, there are different uh, interpretational uh, frameworks to approach the question. So this is still an open uh, one. Artificial life uh, can even uh, complicate this uh, story because uh, this will uh, dim the boundaries between the living and the non-living uh, entities, or there we can talk about even certain semi-living uh, entities. So the other question that what is an organism, uh, the topic of my earlier presentation, uh, in this series, and that is still um, still a very very complex uh, question, uh, far from being uh, uh, easily uh, solved. Are there living entities outside the organisms? Another question. What is the importance of individuality in biology? So, in the case of uh, uh, species, we could see that okay, species are individuals, but species are at the same time, in some sense, similar to individual organisms. But at the same time, this doesn't mean that uh, uh, we could think that a species would be a kind of organism in uh, relation to the role in evolution or in relation to its uh, uh, space-time uh, integrity. What about uh, other kinds of organisms? Brain death cannot apply to organisms, according to that definition, the whole brain death, as we could see, without brain or central nervous system. See, uh, can a plant or a bacterium or a mushroom, for example, die? This can be a question. When we cannot refer to, uh, to the brain, organizing the functioning of the system as a whole. Pro yes, probably we can talk about the death of a plant or even the death of a bacterium uh, and not just a, 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 a metaphorical way. So we probably need an alternative conception or conceptions of death, which can be applied to uh, to plants, for example, this one on the uh, right side. And even in the case of uh, inanimate uh, uh, objects, for example, in this case, the broken glass, we can talk about the uh, glass as something which uh, ceased to be, ceased to exist, ceased to be existing, but at the same time, um, I think that it would be uh, a misleading thing to talk about the death of the, surely the death of the glass. However, this can be, again, metaphorically, uh, this, in this case, uh, resurrected uh, by uh, gluing the uh, uh, parts 
the species uh, together again. And this can bring the vase back to uh, its uh, proper functionality even. So it's a vase again, and in some sense, the same one, but uh, it is not a kind of a resurrection, only in a, in a metaphorical sense, if you want to use or want to insist on using this term. And what about the species again? And uh, there are some pictures and some points from the classic papers uh, of uh, D. L. Hall called Matter of Individuality, which was published in the Philosophy of Science in 1978. You can see, uh, according to uh, the author Hall, there is a very close um, analogy between species on the one hand and individual organisms on the other. Diagrams, this one, which can be interpreted alternatively as organisms, undergoing ontogenetic change and the production of new organisms and as species undergoing phylogenetic change and speciation. Uh, so can use the split uh, of one species in the uh, uh, one uh, B uh, picture, for example, uh, there can be uh, certain changes in the uh, A picture in time, and this can happen with certain uh, organisms as well as with uh, certain uh, uh, species in, um, in, um, in evolutionary time. And uh, the figure two uh, from the same uh, paper, uh, again, it can be interpreted alternatively as organisms merging totally or partially to give rise to new organisms and the species merging totally or partially to give rise to new species. The question here, the question of, uh, of uh, David Hall is that, uh, how can we talk about the beginning that is the birth of a species and the end or the death of a species? So uh, uh, this point, uh, at least uh, he, of course, didn't talk about the potential resurrection of species, but this can be relevant to our question. Some um, quotations uh, from, the, from the paper. According to Hennig, when speciation occurs, and this is a great dilemma for, for uh, Hal himself, the ancestor species must be considered extinct regardless of how similar it might be to one of its daughter species. Simpson, however, disagrees. If speciation takes place when a small peripheral isolate succeeds in bringing about a genetic revolution, see at figure 1D here, then the parent species can still be said to persist unchanged. So in this case, there are two, uh, two species, one new and one is old, uh, still uh, uh, living. If, however, the species is split into two or more relatively large subgroups, then it is difficult to see how the ancestral species can still be said to exist unless one of these subgroups succeeds in retaining the same organization and internal cohesion of the ancestral species. In this case, we can talk about the species as someone which uh, ceases to exist. That is, it is the end of the existence of the species in some sense. Some sense, what does it mean in this case? Similar to the uh, case of the glass or the waste, or similar to an organism or even a human uh, organism? Probably uh, neither of these possibilities. And one very interesting uh, uh, point from the text, one final parallel between organisms and species warrants mentioning. Organisms are unique, unique. When an organism ceases to exist, numerically, that same organism cannot come into existence again. So this can be an argument against the original sense of resurrecting species. For example, if a baby were born today, who was identical in every respect to Adolf Hitler, including genetic makeup, 
he still would not be Adolf Hitler. You even can recall Donald Davidson's uh, famous thought experiment, the Spamman case, uh, which is a uh, about somewhat similar uh, points against the tele-semantic uh, conception. Without the history, uh, an organism cannot be the cannot be the same, even though very very uh, strong similarity. So, for example, uh, phenotypic uh, similarity or even genetic similarity to the original uh, individual. So again, when an organism ceases to exist, numerically that same organism cannot come into existence again. Very, very interesting and, uh, and great insight and very important for, for us. Another uh, pictorial uh, representation of the case, you can see certain uh, times, T1, T2, T3, 4, 5, and so on. And you can see the species A, B, D, and E. And you can see that at the time two A species, species A ceases to exist. And at time uh, four, T4, B3 species uh, similarly ceases to exist. That is the end of the species. If you like, it can be uh, called as a death of a species, but uh, the similarities between uh, the species and the organisms are not uh, so uh, so close anyway. Why? And this will be the ethical part of the presentation. Some ethical points about uh, these uh, potential or already uh, existing um, idea and uh, and the technologies to help it. For example, deontology. Deontology is the first point. What can we say from the deontology, uh, deontic point of view about these questions? For example, we can refer to the respect for nature or the divine creation or respect for life in general, that is the individual life can be another point that we have this uh, uh, obligation to help uh, uh, living things or biological uh, individuals to live or to live again. And uh, deep ecology can be a related uh, uh, approach uh, with the emphasis, with its emphasis on uh, intrinsic value of uh, nature, certain ecosystems, or even uh, particular uh, biological species. So according to deep ecology, we can say that uh, because uh, uh, the species can have certain intrinsic value, we have this duty to help uh, the nature uh, to bring back uh, these uh, uh, extinct uh, species or to, uh, to protect uh, the existence of uh, the species near uh, to extinction. The utilitarian arguments, uh, uh, somewhat... Uh, different ones, protecting the environment. This is the main uh, point in the case of uh, uh, George Church and uh, their enterprise, the natural ecosystems in the case of woolly mammoth, it is to uh, prevent the permafrost to get uh, defrosted, uh, uh, which can be very dangerous to the uh, global uh, warming because this uh, could let uh, uh, toxic gases uh, into the air, which uh, could uh, contribute to the uh, to the um, to the increase of uh, uh, warming in that area, causing uh, uh, enormous harms to the uh, ecosystems and even to the whole planet. Instrumental values. This uh, uh, is about instrumental values of the uh, related species, and these can raise certain uh, certain questions. Why? these natural solutions, that is why the original um, um, uh, woolly mammoth. If we have good reasons to think that there can be even uh, the better or cheaper solutions, which are not really mammoths, but similar larger bodied uh, organisms, animals, can be, uh, can serve as, uh, 
as good solutions to these natural problems, even, even can be better solutions or at least cheaper ones. Why do we insist the, to the natural, uh, original uh, life forms? Why the original version? Why not something uh, more functional uh, created by using the CRISPR technology uh, again? Another utilitarian reasons to resurrect um, um, extinct uh, interesting animals can be because this can be good for education, science, scientific uh, research or entertainment. Uh, you uh, can uh, remember the case of uh, Jurassic Park uh, from the popular movie. And some people, some uh, at least uh, even uh, raise the possibility to uh, to eat these uh, animals. For example, the mammoth burger can be a new possibility for the future, the gastronomic uh, innovation and the agricultural reasons can be uh, taken uh, into consideration here. Other even non-moral justifications to uh, to uh, resurrect uh, extinct species. The first option can be just for fun. We would be happy to live in a more colorful world, surrounded by very uh, very interesting and uh, beautiful uh, species. Can be a good thing or hunting, recreational hunting can be another similar justification, or even art, the so called bio art that is, uh, these animals could uh, uh, be uh, aesthetic values. And justice, the next uh, point. Some uh, people expressed uh, certain worries about uh, justice-related uh, ethical questions in relation to uh, um, the extinction. The first one is the distribution of resources to protect the environment. For example, uh, cloning a cheetah, as we could see it uh, probably today at least, and even in the near future, will be very, very expensive, at least $100,000. This money, can be used more effectively uh, to save other ecosystems, um, already existing uh, ecosystems, or even uh, so creating new ecosystems, good for the environment and good for the uh, for a sustainable uh, economy. Bias toward certain species. There are beautiful species, there are cute uh, species, cute animals. For example, uh, cheetah can be again a good, uh, good, uh, good example. There will be probably a, an emotional bias toward these species, which can uh, again raise certain justice-related uh, uh, um, uh, consideration. Assessment of risks and costs. I already mentioned this point, high cost of protecting uh, particular species. Maybe that could be a better solution overall uh, to, uh, to, uh, to choose other uh, routes to uh, try to save the natural environment. Simple, a basic one in, uh, in applied ethics or in bioethics, the dangers of introducing new species. Of course, it is not a new worry. For example, when uh, uh, we are talking about the uh, resurrection of the woolly mammoth and to, to introduce the species to uh, the Siberian tundra, this will raise certain, uh, certain worries about, uh, about the uh, ultimate outcome of this uh, step. Um, there are some negative uh, uh, examples uh, from the history. The most uh, well-known one is the uh, introducing of uh, uh, European rabbit uh, to Australia, which uh, led to, to great harms in the local ecosystem um, and is still uh, still with us, the, the uh, harms. Then there are some positive, more and more positive examples, um, fortunately. For example, the wolves uh, in the Yellowstone National Park can be mentioned as one example here. And there are, of course, uh, developmental uncertainties. We can clone uh, and uh, editing uh, 
and that we can clone and edit, um, um, for example, uh, woolly mammoths or, or silver tooth tigers and other uh, animals, uh, uh, long extinct uh, uh, animals. But one can happen with uh, with them during the ontogenetic development and is in the, their new uh, environments. So there are many uncertainties about this. It is not enough to just to create a, a genetically similar uh, population, but uh, we, we should see what will happen uh, them in a, in a new natural environment. Is that natural? Another, say, philosophical question related to uh, to the uh, overall uh, problems of uh, the resurrection biology. Is death bad at all? Um, one of the central questions of the so-called uh, philosophy of death in uh, as, as one of the area of current philosophy. For example, we can talk about a timely or untimely death, even in the case of uh, uh, species. Or, or something similar, that is the timely or untimely life span or the uh, span of existence uh, in the case of uh, these species. In, in certain situations, one would uh, say that, uh, so this was a pretty old species, while in the case of young species, our attitudes can be, can be, uh, can be different. And responsibility. And the conscience uh, uh, in us uh, can be another relevant factor when we are responsible for the extinction of the species and when we are not clearly uh, responsible for that. In the case of the passenger pigeon or the dodo, it is quite clear that human greediness uh, was res mainly responsible for the death or the extinction of these animals. And it is quite all right for many people to, uh, to turn uh, this situation uh, back to the natural uh, state that is uh, using biotechnological tools to try to, uh, to uh, resurrect these species. And, and the more general philosophical point that the attitude to death is an irreversible event uh, in this case, in the case of uh, the potential uh, or imaginary uh, possibility of uh, resurrecting human organisms, human persons, uh, sorry, human persons. In this case, uh, the value of life uh, would change. And our attitudes to, to killing a person, for example, in this case, uh, causing the death, sorry, causing uh, the extinction of a particular species, uh, the attitude could uh, change. We could say that, oh, okay, this is not a great tragedy. Next week, next year, or in say in in in, in one hundred year, even we can reanimate uh, this population or the related animal. So the extinction is not not a great tragedy. Yeah. Um, so probably you uh, you understand this point. The value of nature and species again. What can be the value of an individual a biological individual? Uh, called species or the nature, uh, nature itself as such. And another worry, a um, general philosophical one, that this can be part of the overall death denial of the so-called Anthropocene. Okay, closing to the end, I will uh, just mention two other possibilities, which can... Uh, involve uh, other philosophical and uh, ethical um, say considerations or, or change of uh, uh, thinking. The first one will be the potential resurrection of uh, certain predecessors of our species, Homo sapiens, sapiens, for example, uh, Neanderthals. Uh, in this case, the question is that what can, what could happen with these individuals, very similar, very close to, to human beings? What was the proper place of them in our societies? Would be uh, experiments on them or 
keep uh, them in, in, in zoos or thematic parks, would be killed or going to the war with them. So this is a real question, I think. But at the same time, as uh, Richard Dawkins once uh, wrote, this can be very beneficial to our self-identity and our ethical relation to the other part, the rest of the nature, that is to other uh, animals. Today, we can experience a huge gap between humankind and other animals. Our closest relatives are the uh, chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, orangutans, but this is still a large uh, gap. By filling this gap partly, we could see the continuity between animals and humans, that this can have certain ethical uh, consequences this we could be more accept ac acceptive uh, to uh, to our, to other animals or this uh, this primate species i mentioned the other possibility other question is uh, creating uh, by using the same or similar uh, biotechnological uh, methods uh, to to, radic to to create radically new life forms fantasy kind species, organisms, semi-living, semi-artificial uh, uh, creatures. That this will, of course, could uh, make our words more interesting, more colorful, but at the same time, I think that this could lead certain, um, certain um, ethical um, dilemmas, certain problems, challenges, to think about the, the moral status of these uh, creatures, our responsibilities toward them, and uh, their place uh, in the natural environment. What can be the effect, the impact of uh, the presence of uh, these kind of new life forms? This is a question, ethical and environmental, uh, and of course, scientific question. So I think that this is the end, the last uh, uh, slide. Thank you very much. I am curious about your, your reflections on the, my presentation, but I am even uh, similarly interesting on your 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 general uh, thoughts, ideas about this possibility. Have you heard about certain other uh, details, or what do you think about the ethical prospects of this new technology?